Nutson, what's going on, Tursky? This is Two Guys Talking Golf. U.S. Open edition. We got anything going on this week, or was it a quiet week at the U.S. Open? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's a little tournament called the U.S. Open. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if anybody cares, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, we had that going on. And there was gear news flying out there. Yeah, I was uh, I was I was going through the forums uh, and the front page, and you and uh, you and Greg were uh, were pretty busy gentlemen this week. It looked like we were cranking out there. Um, shout out Greg Moore. I think he did forty what's in the bags this week. Oof. So Oof. if you're interested in seeing what pros are playing, qualifiers are playing, amateurs that got into the tournament are playing, past champions, I think he. Uh, he hit basically, basically everyone. I know it's a big field. Forties a lot. It's just a lot of times a clicking. Lot. A lot of times clicking uh, flash on the camera, and I'm sure his left arm is tired from holding up golf clubs and spinning them around. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I gotta believe so. I mean, it, it, even as fast as he is with it, you know, like he's that two to three minutes, boom, boom, boom. I mean. You still got to get the guy at the right time, at the right place, all that. And I've done the thing where I took in hand photos of drivers a couple of years ago, and it was like all the drivers were at like the same time. And I remember I was like, it, it, from holding the camera and then holding the club and all that, like my arms were sore from doing all that. And, and he walks around total with two first cameras. world problem. But yeah, yeah. He, uh, he's the man. So, and then you were busy uh, doing a little interviewing. Saw there, uh, you uh, were were chatting it up with a few uh, few pros, talking a little equipment, which was pretty awesome. It was cool to be able to put some of that stuff on video and put it out, because I mean, you know, that's pretty much my job when I'm out there is to interview these guys, figure out what clubs they're playing and why. So I'm having a lot of these conversations week to week, but it was really cool to be able to put them on camera and like share them with the audience because it just kind of hits a little bit different. Like when you're reading an article and yeah. reading the quotes, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Like, where's the picture, you know, to put on video and hear them actually talking about it. And like, it just changes things, man. Videos, videos really cool. And to be able to put that stuff out was, was awesome. So if you want to see some of those interview video, interview videos that we're talking about, they're over on at golf WRX on Instagram. Um, yep. did video interviews with Sam Burns talking about his now there's a little discrepancy here actually because we're getting some <laughs> some comments on the sam burns video i called it an attack wedge so he has the apex tcb it's an iron it's not yeah. like a traditional wedge but he has an a wedge now some people yeah. call it an approach wedge i call it an attack which i thought it was like one of those 50 50 type things but it seems pretty unanimous that it's not attack and that it's approach what do you call it <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, I kind of don't care either way. I, I, I thought that at one point when, like, uh, uh, when that wedge first came out, I thought, like, I don't know if it was Johnny Wonder, somebody called it, like, kind of like the attack wedge, like you attack the pin with it. Um, but mm -hmm. I've heard it both ways, and I've seen the, like, gap wedge, attack wedge, approach wedge. I've heard it called a, a hundred different things. So I don't really get all worked up about it. But I'm good with the tack wedge. It kind of sounds aggressive. You're going after the pin, like you know, you're you're hitting some uh, you know aggressive shot in there. I, I like that attack label. I'm not hitting a flop shot. I'm attacking a pin. Um, I would yeah. call it a T wedge. Yeah. Uh, stands for tweener. A tweener wedge. <laughs> tweener. <laughs> <laughs> um, and gotta like that. We had then we had Adam Scott talking about his custom one-off mirrors. Obviously, we've kind of drilled that one into the ground i think we've uh talked but, about that enough on this show but seeing him talk about it and kind of showing him off on instagram pretty cool um then justin rose he's playing titleist irons now yeah. obviously an equipment free agent free to play whatever clubs he wants um we'll get into that later that's kind of one of the topics on my very lengthy list of the week but if you want to see him <laughs> talk about it instead of us loves talking about it you can uh, you can check that on Instagram, and then he was talking about his Axis One putter as well, which we'll get into. And we had Justin Thomas talking about his new knuckle neck, Scotty, which we've also talked about yep. at length on this show. Um, 
and then he was kind of explaining, you know, how he figures out what bounce um, to use at certain courses and just kind of the wedge setup that he goes with. And then, was that it? I think there were four um, interview videos. Yeah. Yep. But, yeah, uh, I guess I wouldn't say expect them going forward, but hopefully we could definitely do more of them. I'd be excited to uh, put more of those out. So if you enjoyed them, maybe be on the lookout. Maybe not. We'll see. See what happens. <laughs> All right. Well, you did a hell of a so, job. I was, I was impressed, man. Thank you. I just want to give good content to the people. It's honestly all it is. Yep. You did. So I have a list of about 15 topics here. The show <laughs> might be a little all over the place because <laughs> I do have a bunch of quotes and like statements and kind of inside info that I do want to read. Um, I love the listeners and I just want to, I want to give them the knowledge that I gained this week. So <laughs> a couple, <laughs> just a couple like cool little stories, cool little quotes. Um, you know, I'm not the best at reading. But I'm gonna do my best. So we're gonna go through the we're gonna go through like these it. topics as, as much as possible. We're gonna start with obviously the number one equipment story of the week. Which would be Brooks Kepka. I was about to say I was I was gonna say like eh, probably Brooks Kepka. But <laughs> <laughs> it was yeah. it was obviously uh, a huge deal when he signed with Cleveland Tricks on because he was a free agent coming yep. out of his Nike deal. Um, he kind of gave every company, like, the stiff arm, you know, kind of in the way of, like, listen, I'm winning all these majors, winning all these tournaments, the money's coming in, I got a Nike sponsor, like, I'm good on sponsorship. Then, probably, what, two, three years ago, he throws in tricks on irons, which kind of raised everyone's uh, eyebrows, because he had been rocking with the Mizunos that were custom-made for yep. him, and kind of never thought he was going to switch out of those really and then he goes to Strixon that made me raise my eyebrows of like okay maybe something's going on <laughs> here then he switches to the Strixon ball and it's like okay pretty much inevitable at this point yeah he signs switches to the driver he'd already been playing or testing with at least the golf ball throws in Cleveland wedges you know the whole the whole thing still stay with the Scotty putter but so he had been playing that for Maybe just under a year is when he he officially signed, right? I think it was. Yeah, I want to say it was twenty twenty. It was late one, right about. It like, was like late twenty twenty one. Twenty twenty. Yeah. Um. Way. Yeah, it was something like that. Yeah. yeah. It hasn't been very long. Either way, and he shows up to the U.S. Open this week. No big deal, just the U.S. Open with just yeah. an old tailor-made M five driver. Instead of a Strixon driver, but not only that, he also we uh, me and Greg we catch Kepka putting with a uh, Titleist Pro V1 X golf ball. Yep. So then it's like you put the two together, and it's like what is going on here? You know, there's it's... all sorts of rumors about him going over to live. He's showing up with non Strixon clubs. Like, did he get dropped? Is he dropping them? You know, what's the deal? Yeah, I, I mean, to me personally, and I and I know you have a little more on this, but to me personally, it's just one of those things where he hasn't been playing great. He's been, you know, I guess, I guess now he's healthy, but I mean, he was he was injured for a while, hasn't been playing great. And with these guys, I think you're going to go back to things that when you were like, I mean, like we talked about Adam Scott's irons last week. You know, he went back to an iron with a different sole design that he had success with a few years ago. And I think, you know, Brooks is probably in that same boat. Like, hey, man, I was winning all these majors. I was killing it. Da, 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 da. What can I do to kind of get that that back? And he probably said, hey, let's bring the old big dog out, you know, and then, uh, you know, let, let's try a different ball. I mean, he, you know, for whatever reason, he's got a reason to switch those pieces. But I don't think it's something where, oh, I just, you know, I'm ready to cut ties with Strixon and move on. I think it's just, hey, let me let me go back to these old, fa you know, old comfortable things, see if I can find my way and then transition back into the Srixon stuff. I mean, that's my thought. I think that's probably spot on. Yeah. Um, and I do have a little bit more on this. I do have a statement from Srixon, which I'm going to read. Kind of just wanted to get our, our thoughts out first and hear what you had to say. But that's kind of what surprises me about 
you know, these free agents, why they even do eventually sign. Yeah. And you know, I'm not even like bashing Shrixon equipment. Like you're, you're very high on Shrixon irons. I love Shrixon yeah. stuff. I think the drivers are super underrated. Um, Agreed. The irons are awesome. Love the, the V sole Cleveland wedges. I mean, nothing else really needs to be said about that. Yeah. Classics, absolute classics. And definitely love the raw versions that he plays. But the thing is like, with free agency, you don't put handcuffs on yourself. Like you can play what you're comfortable with. You can test everything, and just pick the best performance. And it's like, to his probably point and mentality at the time of being a free agent, like I'm making enough money from not only my apparel deal, like Nike, but just on the course. And it's like I don't even know. He probably gets a bunch of appearance fees if he wants them. Like tournaments probably pay him to show up commercials like there's plenty of income and i'm not sure how much um sponsorship deals even are anymore from oems like i'm sure he was getting or is getting paid a lot from tricks on but you know in the grand scheme of things probably not like life-changing money i always thought it was more important to be like a free agent like when the free agency craze was kind of going around, it was like, yeah, that actually makes the most sense, especially for PGA Tour players. Like, you know, as an amateur even, I'm not playing for money, but I do like playing stuff from different brands where I'm not locking myself into one thing because each company does. They have slightly different designs, slightly different performance. And then once you get comfortable with something, like you're kind of pressured to put in their new lineup their new product and it's like yeah i wouldn't want to be forced into a new driver what if i don't like it but now i'm in the commercial (laughs) and if i show up with the old driver now it's kind of it's awkward but yeah he did not get dropped from tricks no let's get that out of the way no no (laughs) and and i think you're right i mean i think the amount of money that he's making from michelob and rolex and nike and michelob whoever else he's with yeah, I was trying to think um, of what his good under, uh, sponsors were, and and I don't again, I, you know, you, we don't get the numbers of these contracts, these deals with these OEMs, but I, I got to think it's significant enough where he took it. You know, like it, it, it I, I, if I had to guess, it's 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 over seven, it's seven figures a year. You know, at some point, whether yeah, it's five million, whether seven. it's whatever. I mean, he's a, he's a multi major winner all that it had to be significant enough where he was like yep it's this is willing to go over you know i'm willing to go over there and i don't know if they necessarily built the z star diamond ball for him but i mean that was the one he was playing um it, it was might definitely have been a prototype that, that, that works is a little bit that. different yeah so i mean they were willing to work with him and all that and they probably still are you know it's just like i said i mean i, I think it's this is just that temporary thing of you know let me get back on the horse and once i'm i'm galloping along Let's jump back into all the Strixon stuff. So, right, uh, like you said, it, I don't think it's an equipment thing. I mean, Strixon makes some great stuff. So, so I have a statement. I mean, these were all my thoughts when, um, obviously, he shows up with a different driver, different golf ball. You know, all this is kind of going through my head. So I, I hit up Strixon. You know, kind of on some what's the deal type stuff, and I will read the statement verbatim here so there's no mixed words at all in this early stage of our partnership in this early stage of our partnership brooks kepka has validated the performance of the strixon driver and golf ball though performance has been promising the characteristics are not a perfect fit yet to work through this adjustment period most efficiently we decided to focus our energy on fitting brooks into the next generation Shrixon driver and golf ball prototypes that will debut on tour in the near future. Products developed with Brooks' input and needs in mind. So, like you said, they're working with Brooks on new driver and golf ball prototypes. While we get this organized in the next couple months, Shrixon is temporarily allowing Brooks to use his previous driver and ball. Of course, he will continue playing Shrixon irons and Cleveland wedges. Both parties are fully committed to the pump. To the partnership, and we are confident Brooks will be back in a Shrixon driver and golf ball soon. So there you go. I mean, they're yeah. telling us basically he's not really vibing super hard with specifically the driver and golf ball. He likes the wedges and irons. He doesn't really have a problem there. Um, 
golf ball is not quite working for him. He's probably giving them a bunch of feedback like, hey, here's here's the issue. It's not yeah. spinning enough. I don't like this window. Um, whatever, whatever. Feel-wise isn't quite right. I don't know. I'm just I'm guessing I'm putting myself kind of in Brooks' position. And then with the driver, he's obviously just not at a comfort level. He's probably not driving the ball great. And combine that with, like, once you get that kind of seed of doubt that, hey, maybe I'm not playing the best driver, when you combine it with I'm not swinging well, then it's like you're kind of just pissed off. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and he's like, I want to go back <laughs> to my driver. Like, will you please let me? Yeah. Like, I'll give you as much feedback as you want on all these prototypes. You can bring out 27 prototypes. I'll hit them all on the range. I'll fly to you guys. But right now, like, I'm trying to play in the U.S. Open. This course is kind of tough. The rough's really thick, and I can't be driving the ball all over the planet, and I'm not feeling comfortable right now. Yeah. So, no. honestly, good on Strixon for doing this, for allowing him. I don't know if other companies would do that. I, I think I think if you've got a big enough name like him, I mean, look at how many other guys have, have thrown something, str- not strange, but different in the bag. I mean, Phil had that all blacked out, tailor-made three, mm-hmm. or, you know, uh, mini driver. Wood, that mini driver that he had. Uh, and Callaway was kind of, I mean, they didn't really come out and say anything, but they just let him roll with it until they came out with what was the Frankenwood later on and all that stuff. So it's not 100%. Like, this isn't, like, the first time this has ever happened. You know, I mean, I remember when Tiger was making a switch over to TaylorMade, everybody wondered when he would make a, you know, what, would he have a TaylorMade putter? And, you know, then he did for a while. And it was like, you know, all these things, you know, it happens. And then eventually th- the dust settles and kind of a normalcy of, of equipment kind of happens. So I think you're right. I think come next year, whatever the 2020, 20, you know, 2023 uh, Cirque equipment is, He's probably going to be in a full bag of that or close to it. So, you know, I'm not expecting anything different come next year. This really isn't anything new at all. Like, prototype no. culture. I mean, how many how many tour pros are playing with stuff that you could actually literally buy off the rack? There's always some sort of adjustment or aftermarket something on there. They change the shaft out that's not available to the public. Like, you know, there's always stuff within a lineup, no matter what company you go to that you're not completely comfortable with and you want to make tweaks to it. So they're going through that process right now, and he's just saying, in the midst of this process, the driver and the golf ball specifically, like, I'm super happy with the irons. we got to work it out, you know? So while it was huge news, I don't think it's that big of a deal, and I think actually both parties are handling it pretty well. Like, Brooks isn't blowing them up in the media or anything. Like, nah, I hate this driver. He just threw it in and we all noticed <laughs> you know what i mean like he's not blowing them up and tricks on i think the statement's awesome you know they yeah gave us probably, like enough to where you know they actually said what's going on but like no we're still committed and we're working on it like hand up we're not making exactly what he wants but you best believe in the next couple of months we're going to figure it out and then when it comes out yeah. everyone's probably going to go crazy because it's like wait Brooks, like, helped design these two things. I got to try it now. He likes them. Okay. You know? So it's like, in the future, good marketing. You know, it's good marketing for the next line. And if they're, you know, super committed to making the best line as good as possible, I think it really only improves the product in the end. So I guess that's my thoughts on on, uh, Brooks Kepka shock in the world <laughs> that was like it made me gasp when i saw it i was like wait am i I'm, that's really what i'm seeing right now yeah okay so we can move along we don't we could probably talk about just that topic for the whole show but there is there's other stuff going on other stuff and you know what Bef- hey, before you get into that other stuff oh let me just let you know that uh yeah you know just let me let you know that uh, you know Bridgestone Golf, new line of Tour B golf balls, man. Mm. And you know what? Brand new covers. They've got Reactive IQ. And Reactive IQ is a smart cover technology. It reacts to the force of impact, giving you lower spin on the, on the driver, tons of green side control. So if you're looking for uh, you know, a new ball to try, looking for something uh, exciting, performs well, check out the new Tour B, BridgestoneGolf.com. <laughs> you really kept that ad read super casual. I couldn't even tell you were reading. You know, hey, you know, a guy like me, <laughs> you know, I can I can put those things together. <laughs> All right, 
Let's move along. I want to yep. get your take on the custom gear that was out there because a lot of companies had it, you know, head covers, staff yep. bags, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I spent a lot of time kind of just looking at them, taking videos of them. We, like, put little um, 360 videos up on our Instagram stories. So I know them very well, but I kind of want to get the, uh, the outsider take from you and, like, who won? Because almost every company was doing it. Oof. Yeah, it, it, it's tough because, I, 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 yeah, I mean, I, I like a lot of it. Um, as much as I don't think I'd ever use it, man, Taylor made stuff to beat this year. Like the old school kind of like brownish paper look on the bag and the head covers and the super American flag type stuff. I think they've kind of killed it in a way of I wouldn't use it, but I would love to have it like down here in my little shop as a, a spot to throw some putters and stuff in because it just looked awesome. But this I'm really year, happy honestly, that I'm really happy you like, said that. Just real quick because yeah, it was like fifty fifty with people just in person that you know you talk to. Like, yeah, hey, check out that TaylorMade bag, and they're like, yeah, it's super ugly. Or some some people are like, it's the coolest thing I've ever seen, but it was kind of 50 50 and i was like really confused by that because i thought they did an awesome job yeah it's like tea stained it's got the popping uh, yeah. red script and then they coupled that with american flag head covers yeah they're sweet i thought it was a really nice touch yeah person, i think they but. and like i said it, it wouldn't be a bag that i'd want to carry around to the range or anything like that but like i said mm-hmm. i would love to have it down here in my shop to like off to the side throw some clubs or some putters in and just have it there because I think it's that cool. I think Srixon did an awesome job. There's mm-hmm. a little more low key with the you know the the red stripes uh, that just kind of accented the panels. Classy. Um, but then again, I mean, yeah. But I thought I, I, I thought Callaway was kind of cool with the whole Brookline thing, the baby blue. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it was kind of cool as well. Uh, the Scotty covers uh, I thought was kind of kind of interesting. You know, it took the, us a while uh, to figure out the, what, it what was. is it. The, the, yeah, the clam with the golf ball instead of a pearl inside of yeah. it. Yep. I think that's kind of cool. Um, I, I liked, like, the embossing they had in there. That I don't know what that actually is, but um, I thought this year for the, the U.S. Open, I think everybody did a pretty darn good job. Pink um, had uh, bags, I, I mean, I even like the – yep, which is – I wouldn't say super rare, but they don't do a ton of that stuff. Um, no. The Bentonardi covers were kind of cool, uh, even though they weren't quite, like, the whole huge American motif. They were kind of like – they're – what is it? Like, they're fat cat – but it kind of as a squirrel mm-hmm. and um so yeah there was a lot of really kind of cool stuff and there always is around all majors there's always some cool stuff but i think this year everything was pretty solid like there wasn't one that stood out that you're like ooh, boy that's rough i was kind of proud of all the companies it was just like because you yeah. know they're working so hard behind the scenes the the graphic designers are getting up for it and just making all the product and then some majors it just comes out and it's just like eh you guys didn't need to waste your time on that one. <laughs> you know, I don't yeah. have a specific one in mind. It's just every every tournament, it seems like someone just misses the mark and not good. Everyone did an awesome job this year. It was very festive out there. Yeah. Um, I would personally probably say TaylorMade's was most, like, unique Boston cool. But like you said, maybe not a usable bag. Yep. Um, either way, pretty cool. Uh, while you mentioned Bettinardi, I didn't know you were going to mention Bettinardi there, and this topic's a little bit further down on my list. But I know you were kind of fired up about this putter, <laughs> we'll so up. let's yeah, let's just move it on up real quick. Um, Kevin Chapel, yeah, he has a he has a Oof. relatively new putter. I don't know if he's actually, and like what I asked him about it, I don't think he knew whether he played it in a tournament yet or not. Like he just got the putter recently. <laughs> And I was like, is this the new one? He's like, it's not that new. And I was like, oh, when did you uh, put it in play? He's like, oh, actually, I'm not sure if I did. Like, so <laughs> he probably got the putter three weeks ago or, like, a month ago or whatever. And he was probably messing with it a bunch and forgot that he didn't actually play it in an event. But <laughs> he's got this really <laughs> cool, uh, I you would call that gold? I don't know if yeah. it's gold or bronze, but it's a... Uh, uh, Queen B six, the DAS, D A S S. Yeah, the the I think it's double aged stainless steel. 
uh, they call it there, or the DASS. Yep. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the QB6, as they call it for tour, but yeah, the Queen B6, a little modified uh, with a little, I think, longer uh, plumber's neck hosel on his. It's mm-hmm. welded on. Tour department the on fi- the face, tour department on the sole. Yep. It's a really wide flange. Like when you yeah. have the, the address photo, you can see, I mean, really wide flange on it. Yep. Uh, I, I like the Queen B series. The one thing that I absolutely love, which you just don't see a ton of, and I think I commented in the forum post. That I saw you comment a, in there. Uh, yeah, the the bullet sole. And if you don't know, like a bullet sole, is, it's hard to explain if you're not looking at the photo, like in the forum, um, where they take and basically it's almost like a concave half circle that they just drill out along the sole. Um so it looks like a little kind of bullet in a sense. Like it looks like a little bullet. And they do it basically to dial in the weight without having to adjust the flange thickness or the flange size or the face thickness or whatever. They, instead of having to modify anything else on the, the club visually or anything like that, they just basically mill out a little bit of the sole to get the weight dialed in to exactly what they want it. Um, and there's just, you don't see it. You used to see it a little bit more, and you just don't see it. And it's, uh, it's just a cool look. And I think it looked awesome on this putter, but yeah, I love the color, love the finish. Um, it's just a, a, a great looking putter. I knew you were uh, really fired up too. about it, and I couldn't wait to to hear you talk about this because I did see you comment, and you rarely rarely comment on like the <laughs> the tour stuff. So I knew I had you on this one. <laughs> yeah, and the other interesting thing too is like uh, once again, like we talked about with JT's putter, totally the face milling is super smooth. Mm-hmm. Very little face milling to it. I mean, I think when everybody thinks Bentonardi, they think honeycomb pattern uh, or maybe the new roll control face, which is kind of the uh, the horizontal lines. None of that. I mean, absolutely none of it. It is literally just almost, I wouldn't say like polished smooth, but uh, it's got very, very fine milling marks in the face. So uh, the feel or that sound that, uh, that Kevin's looking for, they probably really dialed in with the milling uh, on that face. Super cool putter. Um, while you were just... Yep. Talking about that, I got reminded of something else that I I didn't have on my little list. But Gary Woodland, did you see his putter? I heard I he had switched. So. Uh, I heard he had switched to something uh, pretty wild. He has a square back two, Scotty, um, but it's got this custom long neck on it, and it's like the longest. Oh neck yeah, I've you know I did. <laughs> oh my god! No, I did see it. <laughs> it is crazy long. Um, they, they, like everybody was calling it the giraffe. <laughs> and uh, there's a uh, a guy on, on Instagram. Um, his last name's Halverson. He uh, he's like the yeah, long yeah. neck guy. Like guy. every putter he has is super long neck. And everybody was in there calling it the giraffe and all that. And I'm like, <laughs> that's the first guy I thought of. I was like Halverson. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's actually kind of a cool putter. It looks a little funky from behind because that neck is so long. But from a dress, it actually is a good looking putter. I think it looks really solid. And again, the longer that hosel, the closer the face balance is going to be. So it's probably either face balanced or very close to it. Yeah, I think, um, like, just to your point, um, like, from a dress, I think people kind of overreact on, oh, that neck looks so long, like, or the knuckle neck. To like, oh, is that distracting? It's like, for the most part, especially if it's a plumber's neck style, you can't really tell from a dress how long the neck is. You know? I mean, just no. the way it sits, unless, like you're doing something weird standing super far or crowding the plate or like the line angle is completely <laughs> off like i don't think you're supposed to really be seeing much of the neck on a plumber's neck in my opinion no and honestly his the same thing i kind of like that wider flange it's a little longer putter from from face to back um the only thing different i would do on that putter i would take the sight line off the top line and i'd move it to the back flange for a little longer sight line personally uh but that's just me but other than that i mean he's got he's rocking the the la golf shaft in it uh, the 135 gram version just a classy looking putter man i kind of wonder what the three x's on the toe mean like on the face of the toe i know i wanted to ask him about it but uh he was like when i went up and got photos of the putter he had just started hitting wedges on the range and that's always that always means you know I got about an hour and a half before I'm going to have the opportunity to talk to him. And it's just so yeah. much stuff was going on, and then I never saw him again. Um, but I will figure that out. I'll actually, what I'll do is get in touch with the um, the Bettinardi guy. I'm going to text him right now, and hopefully by the end of the show, we'll get a, we'll get the response. We'll, we'll do a live, <laughs> a live reveal of what that means. Um, now, 
give me your thoughts real quick while I try to try to send this text real <laughs> quick. Um, give me your thoughts about the Lonto Griffin putter. We're off the rails in my order on the list, so whatever. We're just going to have to deal with that. Um, give me your thoughts about this Lonto Griffin putter. Uh, i I, I got to pull it back up here. What did I do with it here? Um, we have so many things. Like, I'm trying to, like, like, like you, it's like, I know. there's almost like, we're just so unorganized <laughs> today because you just can't find anything because there's so much stuff going on. It's not it's our fault. crazy how... Yeah, I mean, really, it's just a matter of finding the tabs uh, that you want to see because it is just absolutely brutal this week with how much stuff is in there. And if, if you're somebody who doesn't think Golf and Rex puts a lot of content in there from these tournaments, <laughs> uh, go check out the forum right now because it is insane. GolfWRX.com um, yeah, so backslash forums. Yep. Huge fan of this. Uh, it, it's, it's a T7, um, which is basically the mallet that looks a lot of like the Odyssey 7. You know, if you look at the Odyssey 7, and uh, when this thing first came out, everybody was like, oh, you know, Scotty just stole it from here. Listen, putter manufacturers kind of use ideas from everybody all, uh, all the time. Um, but all black. So th- retail-wise, this came in, like, silver with a kind of a black ba- uh, sole insert. All black finish uh, with white sight lines, uh, two white sight lines down the, the inner uh, fangs, as you call them, uh, and then a, a single sight line on the top. And uh, just overall, a super classy putter. It's got a single bend shaft, which I don't know if I necessarily love, but that adds a little toe hang to the putter. Uh, I might go double bend and make it, you know, fully face balanced, but uh, just a classy looking putter. I love the shape. Um, for some people, it gets a little long heel to toe because uh, it's a little longer than number seven in terms of the, how it views. But uh, overall, I think Scotty did a really good with, did a really good job with his shape and. You know, being all pretty much blacked out except the the white sight lines and the big red circle T on the sole is pretty cool. I love that they did an all black version for him because his yep. bag. I mean, he has jet black wedges and he has blacked out uh, like T one hundreds. Really cool bag that yep. he has. Um, but I did talk to Lanto about it just to kind of get his thoughts. And as it turns out, he actually switched this the final round. Of the memorial, so he really? was playing. He was <laughs> playing that. You remember the putter he was playing? It was like a blacked out, sick putter. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So he had like a little custom uh, sick putter, black. Of course, he he loves the black clubs. Um, and basically, he was saying like he wasn't trying to get out of the putter. He really loved the putter. He was just putting really bad. So he was like, you know, I kind of need to need to switch it up. And he was like, going into Sunday, um, I was like 65th and hadn't been putting great. Um, the P7 that they that uh, Scotty made for me a couple months ago, he's like, I was making everything on the putting green with it. And he was like, it's hard to change from a gamer to something new, like mid-event especially. But it was one of those things where it was just like, I can't putt worse than I'm putting, so I'm just going to give it a try. And it was working on the putting <laughs> green. And then then he was like, this was really interesting to me, I thought. No pros basically ever comment on, like, strokes gained or stats, really. They might say, like, yeah, we are like, checking out the stats a little bit. Um, and then I made a change based on that. Like Adam Scott mentioned going back and looking at his stats uh, with the turf for the irons. But he wasn't saying, like, specific percentages and stuff like that. But Lanto was like, I gained 2.3 strokes putting. Um, <laughs> and he was like, and that was with a three putt from six feet. And I was like, are you a big stats guy? <laughs> I was like, are you really in there on the stats? And he was like, yeah. Um, he's like, but I do have to take him with a grain of salt because he says you kind of got to look at – um, like what actually happened because he said if you U-turn four putts like if you lip them super hard and around and you lose two strokes it doesn't yeah. necessarily mean you putted bad um, then if you putted like really well and you gained a bunch of or you felt like you putted really well and then you realize that everyone had a bunch of strokes gained like that doesn't mean you putted well necessarily it's just the greens were easy True. <laughs> you know what I mean like so yeah. he loves getting into the stats, though, apparently. So shout out uh, Lonto Griffin 
I bet he's looking at stats right now. That's pretty Josh. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's got his calculator okay, out. So we he's, got off. Know, putting some stuff together. All right, so we got a little off the rails there. Um, <laughs> let's let's bring it back. So I want to talk a little bit about Rory McIlroy. Obviously, yep. last week he's been like going in on the live guys. Huge. I don't think he's mixing up his sentiments at all. He doesn't agree with them. He's pretty fired up about it, and he's letting the media know. He's letting them know. And then last week, obviously, Liv is the first event, and he's playing in the RBC Canadian Open. Goes out and wins it. Yep. Kind of a <laughs> kind of a big uh, big middle finger, really. But pretty cool on him to like put his money where his mouth is type win. And then this week he's tied for second after the first round. And he's just got this look in his eyes, man. Like He's so fired up, so focused. His game's in a good spot. I think he's really rounding the shape in terms of, like, how he's hitting wedges and putting. He had his best putting round today. Um, but the reason I'm bringing up the topic is because I got to talk to him a little bit this week about what's going on with his fairway woods, specifically the three wood. He's pretty yep. locked in with the five wood. He's very locked in with the driver. The three wood, it seems like he's been switching every week. He's mostly been going back and forth between like the old sim, the sim titanium, which he plays at 13 degrees. It says 15 on it, it's 13. And he's been switching to the stealth, which he plays at 13.75. So I talked to him. I also talked to the TaylorMade guys as well, just to kind of figure out exactly what's going on. So I'll do a brief timeline. And then we'll get into what Rory said. <laughs> Timeline. So, All right. At, at the Players' Championship, he switches into the Stealth Plus. Okay. We got that straight. Yep. Then okay. the Valero and the Masters, he goes back to the Sim. Between the Masters and the Wells Fargo, he did a bunch of testing at home. He tested the Stealth. Stealth Plus and Sim to kind of figure out what he likes, which one's going to go and play, and kind of just like settle himself in because he had a nice month off where he could really do some some strong testing. I'm sure he brought it out to the course, you know, test it on GC Quad, whatever, get all the numbers, figure out what's going on. Obviously, the Stealth beat out the Stealth Plus because at the Wells Fargo he brings out the Stealth. Then he plays the PGA Championship with the Stealth. Then he plays the Memorial and the RBC <laughs> with the Sim. And then he comes out the U.S. Open this week with the Stealth. So I, uh, okay. I caught up with him in, like, a what's going on type situation with the Fairway Woods. And he says the Sim's almost like a two-way. So it's very yeah. low spinning. It's very hot. It's always been a hot head. He said, I can get to high 170 ball speed out of it and carry it over 300 yards. So it's basically <laughs> like a, a mini driver or a two wood. Then he's got the stealth that he has sometimes. So with the stealth, it's basically like a completely different club to him because it's higher spinning. He carries it around 285 to 290, and it's like a little bit more workable for him. So... Obviously, the PGA Tour travels to a bunch of different courses, different layouts, and sometimes you want a three with that you can work off the tee. You think you're going to be hitting a lot there. Sometimes you just want an absolute rocket ship. So he kind of keeps <laughs> both around, so it doesn't seem like he's trying to decide between them. It's one of those things where it's like, oh, you bring a low-bounce wedge and a high-bounce wedge, and depending on course conditions, you're just going to keep changing so I think this is going to be like an ongoing drama where he brings both, plays a practice round to figure out to figure out which one he wants because they're such drastically different three woods. So if yeah. you're wondering why he keeps switching between the stealth and the sim, <laughs> there it is. And if you keep your eye on it, maybe it's fun for you to stay up with the drama, but it's uh, it's not going to let up. So he cleared, he no. cleared that up. And, and I he cleared that one up for us pretty good. 
and, and it makes sense because honestly, like if you were to ask me, like what's you know why would he have you know go between the two? That that's exactly the same. I mean, the original Sim Titanium was extremely low, you know, low spinning. It was pretty low launching. It was mm-hmm. an absolute cannon. But for an average player, it was kind of tough to get off, you know, hit it off the deck and get it up in the air. A guy like Rory could just nuke it, you know, off mm-hmm. the deck from miles away. And then, like you said, it makes sense. You know, the 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 new Stealth Plus. It launches a little higher, like you said, spins a little more. He could probably work it, it you know, whatever. I mean, it, it makes total sense of why he's kind of going in between the two. And, yeah, I wouldn't – if I was him and, you know, depending on the course you play, which one goes in the bag, I, I think, you know, it's not a bad idea. Yeah, I think um, I think that's probably why they, like, made the new stealth stuff maybe slightly spinnier because that kind of presents, yep. like, yardage gapping and – just like a general issue at the top of your bag because now you have two clubs that are basically going 10 to 12 yards apart and that's what people always get on me about it's like oh why do you play a mini driver like you only hit it 12 yards behind (laughs) your driver it's like yeah but sometimes you kind of want that that little option right there you know you want something that's slightly more workable but it really does perform like a driver and i just under yeah like you i understand why he keeps going back and forth especially being two different clubs you're not going to keep both in the bag because then you got to take out a wedge or an iron at the top top part of the iron set which isn't realistic so yep Roy's just going to keep switching between this and stuff i suppose i like it i like it hey it makes sense like i said it's the you know usually we all like seeing all the new gear but it makes sense why he's got something old in the bag i get it okay so I guess we're going to keep it on Taylor Man here just for a second. I look uh, in, I look in Tommy Fleetwood's. No, I wasn't looking in Tommy Fleetwood's bag. I was talking to Tommy Fleetwood's caddy, Ian Finnis. Super tall guy, super cool. He's like, hey, did you see that, that iron that we threw in the bag at Colonial? He's like, it's a two and a half iron. I was like, two and a half iron? What are you, first of all, what are you talking about? <laughs> And no, I did see it. He's like, okay, okay, I'm going to bring it to you uh, tomorrow. He's like, I'm going to bring it out. And he was like, I was actually planning on bringing it out anyway because he might play it this week. So I'm like, okay, what's <laughs> what's going on? And I'm also like, he's probably going to forget about it and not show me tomorrow. Mm. But he comes, he comes <laughs> up on, uh, I think it was Tuesday. He's like, he sees me and he calls me over. He's like, hey, I got it. I was like, let's go. I need to see what's going on here. (laughs) So I look at the iron. It says three iron on it. It's not, like, stamped with two and a half. But it's a TF Pro. So Fleetwood, he started playing in, like, 2019 the P7 TWs, the blades, the Tiger blades. Yep. Then, like, two months before he signed, uh, Taylor Mead built him TF Protos, which... You know, they were doing, I think they really started doing it in 2017, but they were still doing it at the time. They were making DJ Protos, Roars Protos, Justin Rose Protos. So they made yep. him TF Protos, then he officially signs. Um, they didn't hang around in the bag forever. I think he probably played them for a couple months, but then he ended up switching back to the P7 TWs. Um, so whatever was going on with, like, the head shape or groove configuration, something with uh, just the aesthetics, performance, like, I don't know exactly why he switched out of the TF Protos, but the point is they're not in there anymore. He's been playing the P7 <laughs> Protos through the, through the iron set. And he hasn't really been playing uh, three iron for, like, the last year and a half like he might carry it sometimes but he's mostly been playing a seven wood he's kind of with that with that wave yeah. of guys who have kind of mostly switched out of a driving iron or a three iron playing a seven wood um but he does like keep a three iron around for yeah for like windier conditions <laughs> and it was colonial week obviously it gets a little blustery in texas the winds get high and you want to keep it low you want to hit a nice <laughs> Had a nice low running shot. So he wanted something that was going to be super penetrating. So he goes back into the TF Proto stash and he brings out the three iron, which is two degrees lower than the P7 TW three iron. 
Smith. So at the U.S. Open, um, it was pretty windy, like, the first three days. I don't know what the conditions were like in terms of wind out there today. Um, but it was windy, and it was kind of kind of like, are we, are we going to play in this wind? Like, are guys going to go with a driving iron or a three iron, or are they going to go with a high loft and fairway because the rough's up? And I think everyone was just trying to figure that out. So he had the P7TW in the bag, 20 degrees, and the TF Proto, 18 degrees. And we got, we got some in-hand photos of it. It's, <laughs> it's a good look at iron, but I don't know if I'm getting it off the ground. Did it, it, I mean, you just see zero loft on the face. I mean, it's got <laughs> just a little bit of offset into it. I mean, it's you just see top line, and then that is about it. Uh, I'm the same way. And then it's got a Project X 6.5. Uh, in it as well. I know. So, not yeah, even graphite thing, if or I was something weaker. It, yeah, anything. Uh, but the crazy thing is, like, you wrote in the, you actually put a little bit of the story in the the post in the forum that mm-hmm. you can hit it up to twenty yards farther than the twenty yards CW three iron. Yep, that's crazy. I mean, for two degrees, that's insane. That he can. Well, hit I think he's two, talking total. To he's definitely above. talking total distance. Yeah, not yeah, with carry. the roll. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure they carry like kind of similar, and then the TF Proto just. Soon rolls out. Bullets, so it's man. kind of a perfect club if, if that's the conditions you're playing in. If it's like, you know, you got the U, uh, the Open Championship coming up. I think we might see it make a return. But, oh, yeah. Yeah, so I, w- I was talking to them a little bit, and they were just kind of making the decision whether to put it back in play because he used it recently and he likes it. And he was sitting up on the range just trying to figure out whether he is. Um, I did hit him up today after the round to see if he put it in play he didn't respond yet so <laughs> i'll let you i'll let you know if he uh, if he does end up responding so that'll yeah, be another live one which uh, the other thing I, I wonder on that is you know he's got everything that ta- i mean taylor made can make a whole lot of stuff like why would he go do this instead of grabbing like the tiger p772 iron you know i mean like, like they they didn't probably just make one P seven seventy two iron for Tiger. Like, why wouldn't he snag one of those or whatever? Like, it'd be interesting to hear like why he went that route instead of going, you know, like an old sim driving iron or or utility iron or you know the the P seventy UDI or you know. There's a lot of options TaylorMade has in that spot. It'd be interesting to to know why he went with this over one of those options. I'd like to find that out as well, and next time I see him, I will I will ask him directly and report back. Um, Boom. I'm also going to first like find out whether he actually is going to use it at the U.S. Open or not. But we can move <laughs> along. We can move along to a right. uh, change that absolutely did happen, and that is Cam Smith. He knocked... Love Cam Smith. He knocked a half inch off of his driver, and then he also threw in... Um, a Ventus TR in the fairway wood. So he recently switched to the TR in the driver. He's kind of been, like he said, uh, he had a press conference at the U.S. Open on Monday, and they were kind of asking him about, you know, what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. He's like, I'm not really driving the ball great right now, and I'm going to try to put it in the fairway this week because the rough's up. <laughs> he was like, I've been practicing my – my punch outs and hitting wedges around the green because he was like, I've kind of been spraying it. <laughs> um, and the TR, you know, we went out and, and tested it. He was previously playing the Ventus and the TR. It's kind of just a little bit tighter of a shaft if you're looking for um, some more stability and bring that dispersion in a little bit. I think that's a pretty good option to go with, obviously, depending on your specific speed and delivery. But you know, I would say that me and you noticed compared to the Ventus Blue, the Ventus TR is a little bit tighter. So if you want to, like, maybe bring down spin a little bit and bring the dispersion in if you're, like, slicing it huge or drawing it huge, um, maybe that's something to try out. But he did switch into that. And um, ahead of this week, he had been playing 45 inches, but he wanted to try knocking it down to 44 and a half. So him and JJ got to it. Um, and as you probably know, you're, you're a big, uh, club builder guy. Not, you can't just knock off a half inch and then take it out and go play. You gotta, add, you gotta add some weight back in. Nope. 
So he he made sure yeah. that uh, JJ made sure he, he got in the tour truck, dialed them all in, adding some weight back into the head, and they went out and tested it on the range, and it was like money. <laughs> he was like, he finally got uh, <laughs> center contact down. You know, he had been like missing out on the toe and missed out on the heel a little bit. He likes to move it both ways. He likes to hit draws and hit cuts like on command. He had kind of lost that. Um, Previously, whatever's going on with his swing, then he knocks a half inch off, and boom, he can work it both ways. And he said he brought the dispersion in, hitting the center of the face. So, pretty effective switch. You don't think that 0.5 inches is big until you do it. Until you either add oh, yeah. 0.5 inches or take it away. Like, that's a pretty drastic change. Yeah, no, it, it, it really is. And, and I love the fact that... Uh, um, that instead of using hot melt, they put an extra weight in the back of his TSI three. So if you look you at the that? back real yeah. close, there's yeah, there's two weights, so it's animal style. Uh, but yeah. yeah, I mean, half an inch is is three swing weight points. About, I mean, animal that's about style. average. So if you, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah a, a half inch uh, from a club is about three swing weight points. I mean, it, it varies a little bit. Um, so and three swing weight points for a guy like Cam Smith is a ton. Like for you and I. You, you'd notice it was lighter, but you wouldn't be, you know, crazy. But for a guy like him who's so dialed in and has been probably been playing some certain spec for, for forever, mm -hmm. uh, that's probably pretty huge. So getting it back to that weight, having to add some uh, or weight in back into the head to get that swing weight correct, um, which for these guys is nothing. They basically went into a little container, pulled out a second weight, slapped it into the back of the TSI-3 and locked it down. Uh, other guys will toss a little hot melt in the head, uh, call it a day. Uh, but yeah, it's a pretty cool setup. And then uh, from your the photos uh, in the forum, a lot of people got a lot of comments on his grip, which he's using a Tour Velvet Super Tack, which is a very tacky version of the Tour Velvet. It like sticks to your hand, but it looks super glossy when you see it. But mm -hmm. I've been able to feel one uh, when I was down at Golf Pride. They had like a drawer full of like Tour kind of stuff, and they pulled them out, and I was like, wow, like this thing actually feels awesome. They but, look uh, slippery yeah, cool. in like, photos. They, the they look like the grip looks yeah, plastic and slippery in the photos, but they're not. Yeah, they're super tacky. Yeah. No, oh, it like it like pull it like it's you have to like pull your hand away out of it. But yeah, the Ventus TR, like you said, I mean, they're super tight. Uh, I don't remember which Ventus he was playing before. If it was black uh, or blue, I think it was the blue. But yeah. like then the, yeah, the TR probably launched a hair lower, a little bit less spin, but like that, like you said, a little more control with that handle section having that spread toe fabric in it. And, uh, you know, if he's not driving it well, you know, that's a great option to move into something like this and shorten it up, see if he can hit some fairways. And I bet distance-wise, he probably loses very little. Yeah, that's exactly – well, that was my, like, concern, I guess. Not concern. I'm not super concerned about it. But that was my uh, – <laughs> like, what initially came to my mind was, okay, you knocked a half inch off. Are we giving up distance there? Because, obviously, if you – uh, go longer on the shaft. That's what guys were doing to produce more ball speed and distance. So if you take some off, you would think it goes a little bit shorter. But he was saying, uh, JJ was saying, he was like, well, he was a little bit all over the face before. So he's hitting the center of the face now. Like, we didn't lose any speed because the center contact's there. And also, to, to add to that, once he starts getting more comfortable... You know, he's hitting the center of the face over and over again. Now he's got some freedom and confidence back. It, like, frees you up to swing harder. So you might actually end up gaining yeah. speed and gaining distance in the end. Yeah. Which is which is honestly something to keep in mind for amateurs. You know, when Bryson came out and he was like, I'm testing 48-inch shafts, whatever, whatever, and then that whole craze kind of came out. Everyone was fired up about it. I had tested drivers that were longer people were switching to drivers that were longer like i think hovland put in a 47 inch plus driver um i know dj did a little bit of testing phil changed into a longer driver so everyone was kind of fired up like oh should i go longer should i go longer it's like if you end up hitting the golf ball all over the driver face it's not beneficial like if you're one out of six yep. hitting the center it's not worth it if you're six out of six hitting a, a shortened driver like 44 and a half or even 44 like something short where you could actually control it and you're going to hit the center of the face in the long run you're going to average more distance so it's like yeah you might want to you might want to just try it and just see if you like it because 
honestly, having a shorter driver in your hands, it does give you that immediate comfort factor. Which it oh, kind of, yeah. now that 100%. I'm talking about it, I, I, it makes me want to take like half inch off my driver because it is true. <laughs> like you just feel a little bit more comfortable and then you can go after it more and then you have that confidence. Every single driver combination I put together in my little setup, I don't have a shaft that plays over 45 inches. Everything is 44 and three quarters. Smart. Uh, is the, my usual is what I play. And then, uh, you know, I have some 44 and a halfs as well. And it's just, yeah, I don't play anything over 45 at all. Not even, I don't even mm-hmm. think about it. And even like, I would say if you're a retail buyer or whatever, um, obviously companies these days, I think they stay between like, 45 and a quarter, 45 and a half, 45, like all the stock offerings um, on retail. So if you're buying off the rack, don't be afraid to go to like a local club builder or a fitter or something like that and be like, so I want to test out something shorter. Like, how can I go about it? You know, they might have uh, some demo shafts or something like that. You could twist out that shaft, throw that in. Um, Or if you're feeling risky, just go ahead and cut it down and, and ask them to cut help you down. out with the head. I'm not going to necessarily encourage that, but I do encourage uh, people to try something shorter just to see if it works for them. Yeah. Well, Getting nowadays, too, you can now. go get a lot of these heads. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these drivers have interchangeable weights. You know, they've got weights in them. Right. And right. if you wanted to cut it down, you don't have a hot milk gun, you can get a weight from Cobra or Callaway or whoever. Uh, and, and pop it in there now. So it, it is a little easier nowadays to uh, uh, to get that swing weight back if you do go ahead and just, you know, lop off a half inch. Mm-hmm. So I think we've uh, we've been rambling a lot. So I'm going to try to <laughs> try to move this along. But there are only two topics left. Now, you said right. you wanted to talk about this one. So I'm going to bring it up now. Okay. King PLD putters. They brought out two new uh, mallet prototypes. Now, they are just prototypes, and I talked to the rep, Dylan. It was just kind of something that they put together to go out on tour with, show the guys, you know, see what people think about them. They're white, and they're very white. <sighs> very and he was white. saying that it's, it's actually not the first time that Ping made a white putter. He was saying back in the 60s and 70s, it wasn't like, anything major that popped off on at retail they didn't sell them really but they had done white in the past and they're kind of bringing it back and seeing you know seeing what the people think do you like it do you hate it um nudson what do you think (laughs) um i think the head cover is absolutely fire Um, Uh uh-oh the head cover is really cool. The whole like uh, state of Arizona, and then like it looks like they put the counties and a little uh, like chili pepper or something like where I guess their headquarters would be. Uh, mm-hmm. Overall, the white it, it looks terrible. I mean, well, I, I think the what, pepper. Like, I do know the answer to that question. Around. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Because uh, I did. <laughs> Obviously, get fit for a PLD putter. We covered it in depth on the show. Yep. I believe that it's a Serrano pepper on, ah, the, on okay. the cover because their uh, their tour rep, his name is Tony Serrano. Little, uh, little tidbit right there. That's pretty nice. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I like that. But you can keep going um, on the on the white the white putters, guys. It's already cut you off. I just don't like the white, man. No, it's it's just. And, and maybe it's just me, but I'm just—I'm not a fan of the white. I was not a fan of the white when TaylorMade did it. Um, I'm not—I was, wasn't a fan of any of the white putters that came out after that. I understand that people are maybe trying to contrast between the green and the putter and the ball and be able to line it up better. I understand why people might potentially do it, but it just looks cheap. It, it oh. doesn't look good. The, like dang, it uh, like like the milling on the face. I mean, it it just. Like, the milling on the face now looks, like, worse. I mean, everything about it looks way worse than it did in a regular finish. And the other part of it is when you go and buy, if they ever, if if they decide to bring this out to retail, much like every other white putter that ever came out, after the end of the year, there's going to be a bunch of chips and dings and trim, and it's going to look 20 times as bad after a year of playing it. And if you're somebody who keeps it around for a few years, it's going to look like absolute garbage after, like, three years. 
there has never been a white putter that has made it past. I don't care how religious you are about using the head cover. It is going to get dinged up and chipped up and whatever, and it's going to look horrible. But I've never been a fan of the white. I don't like how it looks on the heads. Um, and it's just, I don't know. I, I don't think it, it frames the ball any better or anything like that. It's just a, kind of a cheap look to me. I'm just not a fan. I would never buy one. So how do you, how do you feel about them? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like, well, here's, then, here's my question. But the worst part is that, that they... Yeah. Here's my question. And I asked this question to Ping, but they won't tell me yet because it might or might not come out. And if it comes out, they probably yeah. don't want the story already out there. Um, but I want to know what the finish is. Like, is it just paint? Or did they figure out some unique way to have a little bit more quality control? Because you're right. I mean, all the old – all the old – not Ping – all the old uh, tailor-made putters, like from back in the day, and people still use those putters. Um, even out yep. on tour, some of the old white putters, they're all chipped up, like super bad, because underneath the white paint is going to be a material that's dark, and it just makes it look like even worse than it might be otherwise if it was a different color. It's just so evident on white. Um, but my thing is, is, like, what if they did figure out a way to protect the integrity and keep it white for like years on years. Maybe it's a different material or some sort of way they sprayed the head. I think that's my personal opinion. I think they figured out a way to protect integrity of white and they're bringing them out to see if people actually like them. Cause if they do, they're like, wait till you wait till you figure out what kind of finish we came up with. That's just a prediction and, and I would, for me. Yeah, and I wouldn't be shocked if that was the I mean, Ping is an unbelievable engineering company. So, I mean, I wouldn't be shocked if they did find some way to make some type of white finish that holds up better. But to me, and I don't know, it, it still just doesn't. Like, when you look at, like, the face on, on one of the white putters and you see kind of the, the milling there, and then you scroll down and you look the the milling on, like, the, the time, you know, design that's just like a more of a kind of a chocolate bronze finish. <laughs> Like, just look at the, like, you see the intricate detail, details of the milling uh, and all that stuff. And all that stuff seems covered up by what looks to be, like, you know, Sherman Williams paint. Um, you know, like, that he's got a gallon and a brush and slapped it on there. And it's just, I don't know. I, I've never been a huge fan of the, the, the white putter head and uh, the painted putter heads and all that. Like, I'm, I'm a, a guy who uses a head cover. As soon as I'm done putting, the head cover goes back on. Like, I'm never putting a putter in without a head cover or anything like that and it's still after like a year or so like you'll find one little ding or chip or whatever in there that you're like how did it even happen um and these just i mean that's tenfold how bad it looks so maybe ping did like you said i, I wouldn't be shocked because like i said those guys have some engineers over there who are uh, pretty smart dudes but mm -hmm. i don't know i'm just not a fan not i a just fan. think here's why i say because what would be the point of just out of nowhere bringing a white putter out that you kind of know going in it's going to chip and especially being a mallet like there's just a lot of square footage on there to to catch another club in the bag and once you get something on a super white and like the soles are all white you know there's not much stamping yeah, on it everything going on. like it, it ain't hiding a chip mark on there so um no. i just wouldn't see the benefit of bringing out a white right now, but maybe they do have the PLD program, and maybe it's just like something they might throw in as an option. So if you want raw yep. and rusted, like I tend to like, if you want a different finish, you know, black or whatever, and then maybe have white as like an upgrade option. I don't know. We're just guessing right now. Yeah. But you can check out the photos on golfwrx.com backslash forums. Now, <laughs> let's get into... I actually have two more topics. I'm sorry. No. Is it too long already? Do I have to cut these off? Because I like these two topics. No. We're All good. Right, well, let's get into it. Dustin Johnson. Okay. At the PGA Championship came out that he was hitting nine wood. And everyone was like, what? <laughs> a not nine? That's a big number. That's a lot of loft. That's a big number. So I caught up with him this week. Go through the bag. 
going through the clubs. I'm like, oh, my God. He still has the nine in here. Like, <laughs> it wasn't just a, a tournament-specific thing. Like, he's really rocking with the nine wood. And you look at the hosel, 24 degrees. We were taking photos of it. Look at it from a dress. Looks like a pitching wedge. It's just a lot of loft to look at on a fairway wood. A lot of face. He had already been playing a seven wood, so it's not like completely shocking. Like, oh, here's Dustin Johnson, a huge hitter and a blade iron user, using a high loft of fairway. Like he had already been going down that that path in that realm. Obviously, found benefits from a seven wood, but I wanted to ask him about the nine wood. So I got a couple minutes with him. Um, he also did switch into a new Super Stroke grip. He's going with a 2.0 PT, I believe it's called. Yeah. Something a little and different. I, think it's a, I don't think that's available. Uh, no, it's not out yet. It just, yeah, the shaping of it's a little different. And he's like, once I put it in my hands, it just felt right. So he's rocking with that grip uh, this week. Same putter head, still the black spider. He'll probably be using that. Uh, when he's on the Champions Tour, when he's 70, he's going he's gonna to always use that, use that putter. He'll probably still always test and maybe switch for a week or two here or there. Always ends up coming back to it. Anyway, asked him about the 9-wood. Here's what he had to say. He works with Keith Sabarbaro, uh, the VP of tour yeah. operations over there at TaylorMade, who also kind of acts as, like, mostly the driver and metalwood fitter. Um, but he does all, like, the tour fitting over there. If a guy's testing on the range, he's there. So he goes to Keith. He's like, I like my 7-wood. Do we have a 9-wood? And Keith's like, yep. <laughs> yeah, we got we got one. Why? <laughs> he's like, I want to try it. So he built a, he built a what one. Um, so I guess I'll just read the quote. Dustin says, I started hitting it. And it's just a lot better than I can hit a three iron. Mostly if I have to hit into a green, um, it's just a little easier to stop it. I still bring my three iron with me for golf courses where I need to hit it off the tee. Probably like the open championship, I'll use a three iron. Um, but the nine wood's going to take place my three iron. And he was like, there's not much difference between the way I hit a three iron and a four iron. Like they're nearly the same carry. Um, He's like, the four iron's a little easier to go up in the air, obviously, but the nine wood just really fits nicely in the bag, like gapping wise. So you go from the four iron to a nine wood and both fly pretty high. Like he's obviously going to hit the four iron higher than the three iron. And then if they both carry the same distance, it's like, why, why are we keeping the three iron around? I'm not going to be able to hold the green as well with it. Let's rock with the nine wood. So he was saying I could still hit a nice high cut with it. But I could turn it over a lot easier if I need to. You know, with a three iron, he's like, I can hit a low draw, but you can't stop it, like, on a green. With a nine wood, you can actually hit a high draw, turn it as much as you want, and it's still going to come in high and soft. So there you go. If you wanted uh, someone to vouch for a nine wood, DJ's your guy. And I think for, not to always bring it back to, to amateurs, but it's definitely something to keep in mind. Like, if you're struggling with a four iron, and most of us do, Either look at a game improvement four iron, something where you could have a split set, or check out the hybrids. But nine woods, seven woods, like there's no stigma around them anymore. You know, DJ's playing a nine wood. No, he hits the ball pretty far. He's a very good ball striker. Like, there's no reason <laughs> to be like, I'm too good for a nine wood. That's an old person's club. Like, that's gone. <laughs> you know, there's so many seven woods out there. Yeah. Guys are trying nine woods, so. That stigma's over with. And doesn't he hit it like 240 or something like that? Like I thought I read. In, I think in he flies at 245. Out there. They were saying, yeah. 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 245, yeah. nine wood. I, don't, I mean, I'm carrying driver basically a little farther than that. And that's, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, I mean, you're right, though. The, the only thing with me is, is I'd love to see that thing set down on the ground behind the ball because I have rarely ever seen a seven and nine wood that don't look completely shut when set down behind a ball. Um, I have one of the few seven woods that I've seen that actually sets up pretty neutral in, in the PXG, and that's only because it's turned down in a degree and a half, and it's set flat, so mm-hmm. it looks square if not open. Um, so it would be interesting to see what that nine wood looks like actually set down behind a ball and if it does look shut, but you're right. You see a whole lot of face on that bad boy. 
uh, from address. But, you know, he's right. I mean, I, I've really fallen in love with the seven wood. And the only the only thing I've, I've, I don't, I wouldn't say I don't love about it, but the only thing you have to get used to is hitting it off the tee compared to a hybrid. Hybrid, you would get a little roll. You know, you'd hit off the tee, a little flatter trajectory, you'd hit the ground, get a couple bounces forward, you'd be all right. Seven wood, if you hit it off the tee, I mean, it's, it's only flying whatever it's flying. <laughs> it's done. Like, it lands mm-hmm. and it's over. Uh, but going into a green, you're right. I mean, why not, you know, why not try something high lofted? Because the things are really good, man. Like I said, I've, I've fallen in love with the seven wood. I've, I've really liked it. Well, if you fell in love with it that hard, why don't you marry it, nuts? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last topic. And this is all on uh, Golf WRX Instagram. You can hear from Justin Rose himself if you oh, want yeah. to go over there and watch the video. Um, I just wanted to kind of get your take on it. I'm not sure. Did you watch the video? Yep. Okay. So I'll just yep. kind of give a little backstory for the listeners. He's an equipment free agent. I, I believe he has a putter deal with uh, Access One. I don't know if it's a, a deal, a partnership. I don't know exactly what like the terms of the deal are but aside from that 13 clubs free to play whatever he wants he has been exercising his freedom <laughs> he's kind of been bouncing around to a million different irons um he obviously like had a deal with hanma he was making rose protos over there he had tailor-made prototypes and then since then he's like bounced back to tailor-made irons just He's kind of been all over the map. I think he had, what do you have, Mizuno in there or Mira in there for a second, too? Yeah, I think I, I, he had Mizuno for a bit. Um, yeah, he might have had Mira. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, it's hard to remember what he had, but I, I know for sure he had Mizuno. Um, and he's had a little bit of everything. You know, he's had, he's had some tailor made stuff at the top end of the bag, some Titleist. Um, yep. He's kind of been a little bit all over there uh, at the top of the bag as well. So. Pretty recently, it wasn't this week though. He didn't switch this week. It was sometime recent, but he switched into Titleist 620 MBs. I don't recall him ever playing Titleist irons before, so that was like kind of a shock to me. Has he? Can you remember, like yeah. way back in the day? Yeah, I, I don't have that. Uh, I don't have that great of a memory for that type of stuff. Um, I know uh, our old boy Johnny Wonder used to remember, like, you know, the 1996 yeah, Iron Set. He'd be like, you idiot. Um, In the 1992 yeah. Cadillac Open, he played a Titleist yeah, 4 iron. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but just on Saturday. Yeah, um, right, right. So, you know, th- there there might have been a chance that he did prior TaylorMade, but I, I, I can't confirm that. I'd have to go, like, look it up. So, But either way, it, it was did, a shock, it was a a long, shock to me to see uh, Titleist in justin rose's bag for the irons now he's played the driver and surely the wedges yep. but the irons is a little bit different so a full set of 620 mbs so i wanted to get the story wanted to talk to him directly and he was happy to share he said he doesn't really love doing testing out on the pga tour like when it's monday tuesday wednesday he prefers to do his real fitting somewhere off site. So what he did, he went to Custom Golf Works Sunningdale over in Europe and spent some time with them and just hit a bunch of different irons. Probably blindly, he was probably just like, okay, give me one, give me two, give me three, like not even looking at him, just rifling them off. He said, you know, he was hitting a bunch of different uh, irons and he actually really liked the look of the 620 MBs. And the thing is with them, he was saying basically is that he's getting controlled jumpers out of them, like out of the rough. <laughs> so when you're playing, of course, of course, like the country club that has super thick rough and you can control a jumper, it actually could be quite beneficial. And he was saying because of the groove pattern on the yeah. face, just he was kind of getting more ball speed. Uh, he felt that forgiveness was pretty good with a blade compared to other blades. So it's it just an interesting little story there. I'd never really heard someone mention, like, one of the top reasons for them switching switching into a new iron is they want more jumpers, <laughs> you know. 
especially pro, pro well, golfers, like you mostly hear them talking about eliminating jumpers, but he feels like he can control it. And I think he said um, he's like not learning a different technique, but I think that's what he was implying, like basically learning how to hone the jumper so that basically he could play less club hit it higher and farther than he would otherwise while getting the forgiveness from a lower club, which makes sense to me. It's not something that I've personally thought about Yeah, because I don't play in eight inch rough very often, but these guys do. So <laughs> cool, little, cool little Justin Rose yeah. did it there. Yeah. It's, it's kind of cool though. I mean, that, and that just shows the, the amount of detail that these guys get into for just a, a typical shot, you know, a shot out of the rough that's what they're thinking about. I mean, it's not, you know, for mm-hmm. us, we walk up and go, all right, this shot's 160 yards. Okay, I'm going to hit my 7-iron or whatever club it is yeah. with the wind. And these guys are looking at, you know, the the lies, the law, you know, all that stuff. And, and like you said, I mean, how many guys do we watch on TV each week where a guy catches one of those jumpers, flies the green, and then he's got some gnarly flop shot back onto, you know, uh, a, a surface that runs away from him or whatever. And like you said, if he can kind of control some of those shots and, you know, even make them work to his advantage, that that's a huge, even even at most, even just confidence builder that you can walk up to that shot and kind of have the confidence of like, oh, okay, like this is going to go. I'm going to take a little less club and I'm going to get it on the center of the green with no problem. And, you know, it takes away some of that uncertainty and, you know, you can kind of model your game uh, around that. And I think you play a little more consistent golf. So mm-hmm. that, that, that's pretty cool. And he's been using his Access One Rose. Uh, it's a mallet style putter for since yep. 2019, and he talked about that on there. I think he's probably talked about it a million times. Um, obviously, still in the bag, but I just want to mention it real quick. Since 2019, in the majors collectively, he's gained 44 strokes over the field putter. <laughs> Second best is Webb Simpson at 28. Wow. I would have never thought of that. I mean, I would have never <laughs> thought of that. What a ridiculous stat. Oh, and, like, and I think Justin Rose, throughout his career, you don't think of him as like a really good putter. Think of him more as no. really consistent, awesome swing, great ball striker, and kind of almost like Adam Scott, you almost think that putting is like his detriment. And yeah. Obviously, he found a putter that he's super comfortable with. He's very happy with. He's kept it in the bag. I think he used to be a guy who would be tinkering around a little bit more, switching week to week. Yep. Um, much like I think the Adam Scott comparison works because Scott seems very happy with his Lab Mez 1 prototype. And I yeah. feel like every, every yeah. time I see Scott on the putting green, he's like talking to someone about the putter and basically convincing them to play. <laughs> <laughs> and people want to go over and try yeah. and be like, what is that thing? Because I think they hear that he speaks so positively about it, and he's super happy to tell people the whole, like, tech story behind it and why he plays it and why they should play it. <laughs> so I think both of those those two yeah. guys that, you know, traditionally not great putters, they found a putter um, that they love and they want to share it with everyone else. Uh huh. And and Axis One has kind of a similar thing to Lab in a sense, where mm-hmm. they're both, uh, you know, what do they call it, uh, torque balance. So right. when you hold it, you know, the putter in your hand, the the putter sits straight up, and the face is, you know, uh, it, it's aimed right at your target, right at the hole. So just a little bit of design, the way they put the shaft into the head and all that. Um, and I think Roses has kind of like the fangs on the back, like a Odyssey number seven, but they're done in like a lightweight resin or something. Like they're just, it, it's kind of a, a different design, but um, they're definitely unique. And he's actually, you know, he's found success with it. He's had, like you said, he's had one in the bag for a long time. Uh, but that style putter seems to be catching on more and more. I mean, like you said, the Mez from Lab, we've seen a bunch of those kind of showing up on tour. Uh, the Axis One, I think there's only one or two guys playing them right now. I mean, they're they're not as wildly popular at the moment but uh, again like i said there's interest there and especially guys who are struggling putting but you're right i would have never thought you know he would say you know great putters i mean justin rose i don't think ever really comes to to mind but it's pretty wild that that he putted that well in the majors that's that's kind of crazy that's a big strokes gain putting lead yeah 44 <laughs> yeah, is a lot of strokes yeah, to gain. okay that's so huge. that's pretty much all i have from the us open before we get out of here though 
I do want to give a quick shout out to Chris Goderup. He played, I believe it was his first two years at Rutgers, which is where I played college golf at. I don't believe we've ever had a Rutgers uh, alumni golfer play in the U.S. Open. Goderup is playing in the in the U.S. Open. He's turned pro. <laughs> He finished in the top five in, like, the PJ Tour University um, program, which basically allows you to essentially be – I don't know if it's fully exempt, but you have some really nice exemptions going on. Um, yeah, so he started the first couple years at, at Rutgers, moved on to Oklahoma, and just an absolute stud. Almost won the national championship. Basically contends to win every time he tees it up, no matter what. So he's playing in the U.S. Open this week and kind of starting off his pro career. Uh, turned pro. He's got, like, the Nike sponsorship. He's nice. an equipment-free agent for now. Has some has some raw uh, Callaway Apex blades that are definitely worth a look. But we shot his what's in the bag. So if you want to go check that out, support former, <laughs> semi-former Rutgers, Rutgers golfers. Um, check that out. And we also have 40 other... 40 other what's in the bags, a million different uh, pull-out threads, just a lot of stuff going on this week. U.S. Open was really fun. I think the course layout's awesome. It's going to provide a lot of entertainment with all the live stuff going on. Rory chirping in, in the media, uh, John Rahm talking about it. Like There's just like this little tension going on, and the course itself is just really fun. Fans are getting into it. Um, if you don't typically watch golf, well, I assume anyone that listens to this pod, podcast already watches golf, but <laughs> watch this is definitely must-see television this week, and all the press conferences following the event are also must-see. So enjoy the yes. U.S. Open this week, that's <laughs> an, is what I'm trying to say. Hey, you do the same. Uh, I'm going to try to watch as much as I can. Like I said, tomorrow and Saturday may be a little tough, but I'll probably get a little bit of, a little bit of time on Sunday to, uh, to sit down and watch. All right, who's your pick to win? I guess it's it's unfair because we're already around in. But um, I think I said in one of our internal meetings we were talking to some guys. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm going to go JT. I mean, I know okay, you know he's already won a major this year, but I'm going to give him a, a second major this year. So let's uh, chalk it up to that boy. He looks fired up, ready to play. Maybe this is some recency like two bias. Back, two or three back. Might have a little recency bias going on, being that he just won last week. But I got to go, Rory. Just. <laughs> I saw the look in his eyes when I was talking to him, and I'm like, he might never lose again. So I'm I'm riding with that vibe <laughs> that he's just going to lay the hammer down and just big fist pumps everywhere on Sunday, and he'll, he'll be fired up in the winning press conferences. I love it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so that's it from the U.S. Open. Huge week in gear, a lot of stuff going on. Sorry for the longer podcast, but yep. it's the U.S. Open. So. We'll see you guys next right. week for I'll be at the Travelers Championship. I think there's something big on the way. That's what I'm I'm hearing. And it might be dropping at mm. the Travelers, so keep a lookout on either Monday or Tuesday. And uh, we'll see you next week. We'll be talking about it. That was Sweet. Two Guys Talking Golf. Still go.